Scaling to Sourcing, Overcoming Recruiting Challenges webinar. My name is Katie Klein, and I am a Customer Success Associate on our on-demand sourcing team. What we do here on the on-demand sourcing team is we source and engage candidates on behalf of our clients. And in doing this, we use our own software, but this is complemented and further supported by third-party tools that we also use. We're trusted strategic partners who work on behalf of our clients to build pipelines. And we really do this for all positions. So this could be anything from a CDL truck driver, a chain restaurant manager, a fitness instructor, healthcare professionals, account executives, C-suite executives. Um, we really do it all. And our approach allows us to have really as big or as small of a reach as our clients are looking for as the role requires. Um, with the range of work we do, we certainly run into many different challenges across many different industries and geographies. So uh, hopefully we're able to give you guys some tips today that will help overcome those challenges. I'm here today with Nita and Nita Malakal is the head of global, sorry, she is the global head of talent acquisition at Velocity Global. She formerly oversaw talent acquisition functions, which included analytics, research and operations, and she led globally distributed teams for over 10 years in disruptive business environments, including Amazon and Lemonade. She is a huge believer that when it comes to talent acquisition framework with continuous focus on people at the center, and she believes that this is tied to contribution, capabilities, career, compensation, and connections. So welcome, Nita, and I'm very excited to get to talk to you today, all things sourcing. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. And uh, first of all, Katie and team at recruiter.com. Thank you for inviting me and I'm excited to be here again. Um, and it's such an honor to be a part of such a hot topic in our recruiting communities globally. So thank you. Absolutely. It's definitely a hot topic right now. Um, in the past couple of years, I feel like there have been just so many different challenges when it comes to sourcing talent. So this could be really anything and everything that we're seeing in the candidate market, right? So this is compensation confinements, location and regional confinements. Uh, sometimes it's the hiring manager wanting that purple squirrel, as we say, in the world of recruiting. Um, even going as so far to say, you know, when candidates, you think you have a great candidate and you find out two days later that they've completely ghosted you. So when it comes to facing any of those challenges, in addition to any other challenges, what would you say are some of the things that recruiters should keep in mind as they face challenges of today? No, this is a great question. And I, I'm hoping I can share a few insights from my learnings and past experiences as takeaways for our audience today. Um, so let's admit we have several tools and channels that provide talent mapping, sourcing, some very powerful engines in our market that our recruiting community cannot live without. I do have to say it's LinkedIn Recruiter at this point. Um, but when it comes to laying out top challenges for recruiters to source is, is actually the art and science behind on how you convince a prospect or a lead to pay attention for three to five seconds on, on your punchline or your pitch that is coming their way via an email or perhaps an email chat or a message. So let's break it down, the art being the optics we present to our audience on who we are, what do we stand for, how does it click from converting a lead to an applicant or a prospect to a candidate? So for me, first and foremost, let's talk about the art make your rhetoric match your reality. Um, I know often employers, companies think about employer branding is about recruitment, marketing, and of course, significant portion it is. But if you're building a great marketing engine on job opportunities and your employee experience does not match the very pitch about what their experiences are or what about this job opportunity, it does not take long for candidates and employees alike to notice the gap. So today we have several mediums on how companies are ranked thanks to employer review platforms, which are now part of every job seekers tool. Um, and I know one example here, I recently joined Velocity Global that I've learned is our employees value 100% remote job type uh, work style. And it aligns with our Simplify Work Anyway solutions that we provide to our clients saying that, hey, we can hire, manage, and pay global talent on one single platform. And today, internally, we are close to 820 employees in 52 countries. So this concept is reality for us. 
So the art of sourcing is to back up your rhetoric to match the reality. And sourcing is all about consumer perception. And it has to have a solid backing with employee experience for that, you know, what I talk about as magical conversion where a lead turns to a candidate. The second piece is on the science. We need to think beyond compensation. And Katie, thanks for bringing that up, uh, you know, um, when you introduce uh, uh, the, this topic earlier. We definitely need to think beyond compensation. I think gone are the days where our job seekers think about job title and, and uh, salary, which of course, you know, have been historically two co key components of sourcing. But today we need to sell or talk and actually be authentic that way on the solid understanding of who is a hiring manager? What is a business overview? What does a job scope look like? What does this job scope look like? Again, I'm talking beyond job descriptions, by the way. What is a three-year or five-year strategy of this company? Uh, what is my opportunities for learning and development, enablement? What does flexibility, flexibility look like, right, in work styles? So it's certainly moving from that job title plus salary, which is historical trend, towards a total rewards that can relate to a job seeker's career path, learning, flexibility, employee resource groups, belonging. Uh, you know, do I, do I belong here? How, how are you going to convince me on the, on the, you know, what are the initiatives that we have on the DEI piece? Um, so does that make sense? You know, those are, you know, two pieces that I think that, you know, recruiters are challenged with when they're talking about uh, presenting an opportunity. Absolutely. I think um, hitting on your second point there, I think looking at the total package rather than just the compensation is so important these days. And it goes so far beyond any monetary aspects, right? So we're looking at work-life balance. We're looking at the flexibility of working remote, working hybrid, working on site. And really it's about making sure that as a candidate, one, you're finding a company that aligns with your values. But as a company and as the hiring manager, you're bringing somebody onto the team who's going to be happy long-term um, and not start looking after a few months in the position. So it's interesting to me how in the past couple of years with the pandemic and everything else, those values from people looking for jobs have kind of shifted from compensation to so many other things. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Kind of jumping topics here a little bit. Um, but what advice would you have for maybe a smaller company, a more niche company um, who might be looking for a very specific role um, and say their total addressable market is pretty small as far as what candidates they have available with the skill set that they're looking for? What advice would you give to a recruiter or a hiring manager who's, who's looking for a candidate in a small addressable market? So I'm going to play my uh, or put on my recruiter's hat here because I, I think we need to really uh, bring it down to uh, I want to understand or let's clarify the why on the logic behind this approach, right? Okay, it's a market. Why did you choose that market? And it could very well be a revenue opportunity for a given set of products or services that the company is offering, or it could even be, hey, this is where the talent dense, you know, uh, talent dense market is. You know, this is where I, I believe. Uh, the people with that skill set that we are looking for or the competencies that we are looking for is available. So first we want to assess that, the why or clarify. Uh, and once the you know, recruiter, the hiring manager, you know, once we are aligned on that, uh, we, I, I definitely want to assess the talent pool in that market and develop a strategy, right? And here's where some of the AI powered engines help with talent pool or talent mapping, talent intelligence that come into play because it gives you real time data on your industry and identify skilled and diverse candidates and reduces time to hire. But again, I want to take it back to one step in you know, a backwards as to my overall sentiment here is we really need to understand if the company is investing in a balancing act of designing for speed or designing for sustainability, or is it a combination of both? Uh, so, you know, my follow up questions, uh, you know, playing that recruiter hat is would be to do we have dedicated leadership that who are willing to be part of this hiring and uh, perhaps even hiring at scale as the company scale grows for this addressable market. The second question that I uh, that plays on my mind right now is, do we want to think about a hub strategy in the future, because we want to be setting this up with a design that is for speed and sustainability of the company. And my key advice to the company would be to let's redesign or build teams to, and move, to move from acting agile out of necessity 
to being agile by design. So let's let's really advise our company stakeholders to move from you know that acting agile because hey you know this is where we see the market or the talent pool is but let's do this by being agile by design Mm -hmm. absolutely that that makes so much sense and i think that's a great strategy to have you you brought up nita that ai recruiting how would you say that your recruiting and how how do you think in general recruiting has been impacted by that ai component I think it's been very helpful. I mean, it's been monumentally helpful, I would say, because AI-powered recruiting saves time. I think most of us, our audience, and most of us know it, it saves time by, uh, we can screen applicants faster, we can fast track qualified candidates. So it really brings or shrinks the time to hire. So uh, it also does bring all our leads to one place, uh, create sequence emails for periodic reach outs and put pretty much talent engagement on autopilot. And I say talent engagement on autopilot uh, because although it has many advantages of, uh, you know, we are able to reach out to channels uh, that our targeted audience prefer, um, it allows to devise multi-channel engagement. Um, I also want to go back to that sort of the basic piece is that you know, the, it takes away the work that consumes consolidating top of the funnel, reaching out to networks, working the references, the workflow consumes that more energy, but then the final act of hiring itself. I'm not still convinced that AI powered engine can replace all workflows of recruiting because we are in a candidate relationship management with many of the top of the funnel buckets, such as leads and all of those aspects can be uh, or our bundled customers or prospects can be all be distracted with many shiny objects, right? At any given time, there are many opportunities that are being presented. So thus relationship building and management, relationship management is critical for us as recruiters to get to the finish line, to hire the best talent for our companies. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I see that here as well. So we, of course, use AI a lot. Um, It's one of our main softwares, but you have to differentiate between the different roles and what's going to work best for each role. So for example, that restaurant manager role that I spoke about earlier, that might not be the best for AI. So there you might have to leverage job boards. Um, LinkedIn tends to work well for C-suite executives. Um, You know, that AI is always going to be there and it's a great time saver but it really works well for those roles where you want to make multiple hires because it's saving you time. It's really helping you narrow down the right total addressable market. And then it's helping with your outreach efforts as well. So it's all about knowing the audience, knowing where you're going to be able to reach people best and kind of figuring out a plan and a strategy based on all of those factors. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Changing uh, lanes here a bit, Nita, do you have any tips for minimizing drop-off? I know that's kind of a common problem these days uh, all across recruiting. Any tips or tricks that stand out to you? You know, I always go back to the basics. You know, if they have a reason, they meaning a job seeker or candidate, if they have a reason to remember you, uh, it's harder for them to walk away. Uh, so create human focus, but tech enable workflows, right? Uh, so yes, let's use more technology to, to create a human oriented process. It seems oxymoronic, but uh, he, you know, here's what it makes it work. We wanna use technology to enable quicker movement through the mundane processes, but the goal with the technology in our candidate journey should be to get them talking with a real human faster not replacing the human element. Um, and uh, that's something that we want to be uh, making that intentional or conscious effort on making sure that it's not uh, it's not being replaced. Um, and of course, you know, you know, when we talk about that velocity or the speed, you know, these use cases could include assessment prompts or scheduling or upcoming event reminders, uh, using software to automate scheduling, remind candidates about interviews and next steps, all that we can we can get it done with uh, some of our t- uh, tech enablement. But when we get this person or this candidate on a, on a virtual setting or an in-person or however we are, our method of, uh, you know, assessing that talent, we want to focus on that interaction wholeheartedly. So that's that's where I would I would say that it's about you know how do we minimize uh, dropouts is 
uh, again, back to the basics, if they have a reason to remember you, it's harder for them to walk away, you know, so it's about what we are presenting is meaningful to the person who's hearing that opportunity. Absolutely. I think this also ties well into our first discussion topic when we talked about kind of making sure that rhetoric between candidates and then actual employees matches up. Um, it's so easy today to see what reputation a company has. There's so many different avenues for that glass door um, level. There's many different resources for candidates to kind of do their own research that they don't even need to reach out to connections or potential colleagues on LinkedIn. Everything's there on the internet. So I think another important piece of minimizing that drop off is to make sure that what you're advertising to the candidate is gonna be the same experience that they have as an employee. Yep, that's great, yeah, yeah. Um, what recommendations do you have for companies who might be having a hard time sourcing the right talent in today's market? Does anything stand out to you? I think it's very important for companies to really take an approach to, uh, you know, our, our best use of research comes from recruiter feedback because our recruiters are on the front line talking to our customers, our candidates, right? So uh, I really... Uh, sort of encourage uh, the companies or, or the other or teams that are that are interacting uh, you know who's behind you know how do we bring out that best candidate experience is to evaluate recruiter feedback on sourcing what are we seeing as blockers for prospects to turn into applicants what what is the feedback uh, that are are you know, public facing whether, again, you know, prospects talk about us, right? What, what, what are the pieces? So we need to really take a look at and pay attention to what are the things that are, uh, that can be uh, improvised or iterated uh, in many sense. Uh, that could be maybe, do we need to take a fresh look at our compensation benchmarking, uh, you know, how we do pieces? Uh, should we move to additional locations? Uh, perhaps the company has listed uh, an opportunity in, uh, um, let's say Philippines, and we want to make sure that, hey, is this something that I can move to additional uh, locations to have a larger talent pool? Um, I think uh, is remote an option for this role? That's a key question for pretty much every job uh, that's posted these days. Is it possible for us to create that flexibility and uh, have a uh, hundred percent remote or you know hybrid? Uh, focused roles. Um, I think that uh, another key piece that I look at is again to to our earlier question about you know are we being transparent about our culture, our org structure, what is our job scope, you know, learning opportunities, and I think these are all being um, again back to that question about you know moving from the job title and salary to more about you know that holistic approach about what is it in it for me for me to join. Um, Velocity Global, you know, uh, the, uh, you know. Uh, so I think we need to really uh, understand where where are the areas that we need to improve on and uh, have that continuous effort going. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it is as easy as being more flexible with working environment or being a little bit less structured when it comes to those in office hours or whatever that may be. It sometimes not adding $20,000 to the salary. It's a lot simpler than that. So those are some great points. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I do. We have a couple of questions building up in the question box. So I kind of want to switch over to questions and answers now. Um, if you have not submitted a question and you have one, please feel free to put it in the box at the bottom of the screen there. I'll go ahead and open them up. Um, here's a good one. What do you do when you've exhausted all of your sourcing pools and still haven't found any candidates? Do you have any insight there, Nita? I think, you know, we've, uh, I'm sure we all have stories to share here because I'm sure we've all gone through this uh, at some point uh, in our recruiting community. Um, I would, I would want to evaluate what is it that we are looking for in this job? Um, I'm very used to having worked uh, in uh, multifaceted industries where uh, we sometimes put job descriptions out there uh, because our expectations could be uh, could be looking for that unicorn or uh, I think you mentioned purple squirrel, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then we want to go back to really figuring out, okay, what are we trying to accomplish in this 
in this job. Uh, and look at that job description and see whether is this job description or job scope for that matter, uh, can this be contained by one person? Um, I, I have uh, worked and uh, you know, supported sometimes in uh, uh, many occasions uh, in my uh, career that uh, we, we need to really take a, a bold approach and stand our ground as recruiters because we are also talent advisors to advise our leader or hiring manager or hiring leader saying that, hey, this scope or description that you put out let's make sure I understand the job scope because this probably needs to be done by two or three folks. Uh, you may want to look at a you know, more uh, tangible job scope uh, instead of saying, hey, I want this person to do this and that and, and all of it um, in, a, in an attempt to sort of perhaps the reasoning behind is to save on maybe headcounts or save on um, the you know budgetary restrictions, right? So I, I really hope we, as you know, the recruiting community, take an approach on standing our ground to understand the job scope instead of just going with that job description uh, and some of these signals that why don't we have talent um, available in the market and we are struggling on the sourcing is perhaps let's look at that job description once again to see who we are looking for. Great points. Um, what tools, or do you have any tools that you would recommend for gaining feedback from candidates about how their interview process went? I can, I have an answer. I would take it back to basics, right? Give that candidate a call, send them an email, close the loop, have an honest conversation and try to get their feedback during that conversation. I think as much as we want to talk about AI and being efficient, um, at the end of the day, we're working with people. We're in the business of people. And there's no better way to get that direct feedback by asking them, you know, how did things go? What are your thoughts? How are your feelings? And um, I mean, sure, there's tools you could use. You could look at Glassdoor reviews. I know there's a few companies that send out surveys on your behalf to kind of find out how the interview process went, but nothing is going to be as informative of, as having that one-on-one -on -one conversation. I agree with you. I mean, if I, if I could add one other piece is, yes, yeah. right, you know, there are many Qualtrics and different types of surveys that goes out. And um, I've always seen uh, more success when we close out the cycle. So when I say close out the cycle is we deliver the candidate or we, you know, bring the candidate to that employee, uh, the, the day one experience, right? Because that's what we are responsible for. We, we bring them that over, but we need to have that connection to understand, okay, what's been your candidate experience? Um, many times I've seen that our surveys typically don't get the full benefit of uh, folks uh, spending five seconds or 10 seconds or maybe even 30 seconds to, to answer uh, because you know, they're also looking at many other surveys from other, you know, from other companies and opportunities, right? So keep in mind that our, our candidates are kept very busy with these uh, surveys that's coming out from every company. But sometimes a, a, just a call, uh, a check-in 30 days later or 60 days later can bring back very valuable feedback that can be very, very, um, meaningful for our ongoing process on how do we better or how do we improve our candidate experience. So I almost think about it as does our workflows, our uh, recruiter workflows, do we have a check-in mechanism as to do we actually go back and talk to that candidate in a periodic uh, check-in? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like the idea of kind of building it into your formal process rather than just leaving it as an afterthought. That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like this question. How can a non-recruiter at a company support internal recruiters, even if that employee isn't directly involved in the hiring? Oh, plenty of ways, because I think it, it's about, I look at uh, every employee, uh, and I know at Velocity Global, we go with the model, every employee is an owner. So um, I think we all have the responsibility as long as you know we are employed by the company to to look out for that uh, talent that aligns with our company values or uh, principles, what, what, what we stand for, right? So um, 
I'm sure many companies, including us, you know, we have a great referral program. So um, you, you mentioned about the non-recruiter piece. So uh, I'm assuming this person could be an employee or a contractor, whichever way they're engaged with our company, um, could definitely provide referrals or uh, perhaps um, engage in, um, you know, uh, where we are. I know many of our conferences are opening up beyond the virtual setting uh, after the past couple of years. So, uh, you know, where they can accompany and really talk about their experience uh, to be part of that recruiter, the elevator pitch that the recruiter is presenting while they present the opportunity to the uh, job seeker. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that unless you are in recruiting, you don't realize how valuable those referrals are. Um, I like to think of it as, you know, you have a friend, you tell them about the opportunity and they're they're primed, they're ready for that conversation and they're enthusiastic about it, which is a great resource for recruiters and a great resource for companies as well. Yeah, and I, and I think it's also a relationship because, you know, um, in many facets that, you know, these are all relationships that could turn into sales, it could turn into yeah. um, an employee experience. It, there are many connections that that's being made, you know, because back to that people at the center, it's about, uh, you know, connections and contribution. How are you contributing to the overall impact of the company? Absolutely, absolutely. I think we have time for one more question here. Um, so this question is interesting to me because we've talked about current challenges, past challenges, but this question asks, what are the biggest challenges in recruiting that you see in the next year? I think our work style, uh, you know, how companies look at um, working from anywhere. Uh, I, know, I know that we do holistically here at Velocity Global, but um, I think uh, more of these conversations and topics as how, how do we revolve around um, the, the remote or the flexibility in work styles. That's going to be a huge topic as we start to build out for the next, because the future of work anywhere is not going to go, uh, it's not going to, uh, you know, get uh, diminished, right? It's just going to, it's, it's staying here um, uh, for the future, right? So uh, I think that's one piece that I would want to categorize as, you know, uh, as a top uh, topic or a line item for me too, when, when we think about uh, the biggest struggle because there are going to be recruiters that has opportunities that is remote uh, or 100 percent remote and there are opportunities that where you have to come to work uh, in an office location so uh, that's going to be a huge uh, sort of a differentiator in the in our, in our game plan yeah yeah that's immediately where my brain went as well you hear of so many people taking time and going out of the country for a month or so while still remaining working, engaged in the workplace. And I think the sooner that companies adjust to that overall lifestyle change, the easier time that they'll have within their sourcing efforts. Yep, that's right, yeah. Wonderful. Well, Nita, thank you so much for your time today. I greatly enjoyed this conversation.